good. Bless the churches of which we are a part. We thank thee that there too we experience the unity of the body. Bless our seminary. Equip young men for the ministry of the word. Bless the professors as they instruct them in the ways of preparation for taking on the responsibilities of bringing thy word and the sacraments in a right and good and godly way. Raise those young men in godliness. Increase their faith that they may exercise it in a true piety as they walk before thee. Give them knowledge, but may they know that knowledge while loving the flock and loving the Lord whose they are. Bless our missionaries. Continue to equip and strengthen them. We thank thee for the fruits that thou hast given to their labors. Those are sources of encouragement. Continue to bless and strengthen each one of those three missionaries. Bless Robert Smith as he continues to prepare and equip himself for work in the foreign field in the Philippines. Bless the church there and the saints there that they may continue to serve and love thee with great zeal and energy, with a desire to exhibit the wonders of salvation. May they know that and delight in it. Bless those congregations that are vacant. Continue to strengthen them in Lacombe, in Calvary, in Byron Center, as they learn that they have to wait on thee, that thou wilt give them a pastor of their own in good and right time. Strengthen the elders there, but in all of the churches, that they may be zealous to care for the flock with a tender love that exhibits thy love, and with wisdom, with patience. Bless all the deacons in their work, and those among our congregation too, in an especial way. The, difficult, the times are difficult. Strengthen and equip them with wisdom to help the saints that are hurting. Give thy blessing to all of thy people, Father, and to us now as we worship thee, Open our ears, give us attentive hearts, and may we fulfill that first work of the Bereans with all readiness of mind. May we receive the word eagerly, with anticipation, with minds and hearts that are open to what thou hast to say. Give us that spirit of Mary that sat at the knee of our Lord Jesus Christ. Speak, Lord, we cry with Samuel. Speak, for thy servant heareth. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's express to God our thanks and praise now, giving first of all for the cause of the Seminary Student Assistance Fund, and then secondly for the Myanmar Project Fund. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all of the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that, Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. And what he means with that is that out of the three different times that the Babylonians came to take captives, this is the first. This is when they took the cream of the crop and brought them. And as we're going to see in verse 10, this is when the 70 years, the duration of the captivity was to begin. So the count started here, at this time with the first captivity. Now Jeremiah sends this letter by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, 
and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent unto Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city whither I will have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye have caused to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord thoughts of peace, and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me, and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Because ye have said, The Lord hath raised us up prophets in Babylon. Know that thus saith the Lord of the king that sitteth upon the throne of David, and of all the people that dwelleth in this city, and of your brethren that are not gone forth with you into captivity, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will cause and will make them like, the, like vile figs that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. And I will persecute them with the sword, with the famine, and with the pestilence, and will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, and an astonishment, and an hissing, and a reproach among all the nations, whether I have driven them, because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord, which I sent unto them by my, prof by my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, but ye would not hear, saith the Lord. Hear ye therefore the word of the Lord, all ye of the captivity, whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, of Ahab the son of Kalahiah, and of Zedekiah the son of Maaseiah, which prophesy a lie unto you in my name, behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. And of them shall be taken up a curse by all the captivity of Judah, which are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make thee like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in a fire, because they have committed villainy in Israel, and have committed adultery with their neighbors' wives, and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Even I know, and am a witness, saith the Lord. We stop in our reading of the word of God at that point. The text that God gives to us tonight, out of Jeremiah 29, is found in verse 11. 
Rather familiar and beautiful words. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil. To give you an expected end. No one likes captivity. No one likes the famine, pestilence, and sword. And it seems that the captives, the men of skill, and the men who ruled, the princes, were the least who anticipated such a captivity. And once they were in captivity, they chafed under it. And they expected it to be short. And they expected to be able to return out of the captivity very quickly. That was their expectation. There are wrong expectations, and there are legitimate expectations. <coughs> God has an expected end, and he knows that expected end. But many times, we have expectations that are unfounded, based more on what we would like or desire. And then as a result, they're the occasion for great disappointment and great discouragement. Wrong expectations lead to despair, depression. But God doesn't want us to think that it's wrong to have expectations. He just wants to teach us that our expectations are to be built on a right foundation. In fact, he has an expectation for us, and he wants us to know that. And in this passage of the Word of God, he comes to us with an assurance that we are to realize that He in his goodness and wisdom and love thinks about us. He wants us to realize that we need just to know that we are in his thoughts. That he thinks. And that he knows his thoughts. I know the thoughts that I think about you. The thoughts of peace and not evil. Thoughts that will give you an expected end. Literally, a future and an expectation. That Knowledge is what he wanted the captives to know so that they could, if you will, take a deep breath and sigh and just relax and heed the word, build houses, dwell in them, plant gardens and vineyards and eat from them, marry, give in marriage, don't decrease because of sorrow and regret. Increase because I have an end. It may not be what you think, but I have a good end for you. And that's the same thing God has for us. He thinks. 
He knows us. And he knows what he thinks about us. And he doesn't want us always to be able to know where he's going. He just wants us to know that he knows. And that's enough. Is it? Can that be enough for you? That you know that he knows? Do you say, no, I got to know? Well, then we don't have to trust. But he calls us to exercise a faith that trusts him. That he knows. He knows his own thoughts. An interesting way to put it. We consider that first. God has thoughts. Then we want to consider what those thoughts are toward us. And we're going to see that are those two things. That they are thoughts of peace and not evil. And that they are thoughts that have a future and an expected end. And then finally some brief comments of conclusion. God has thoughts toward us. When we read that, then the first thing that we have to remember is that as we try to understand what it means that God has thoughts, that we not forget Isaiah 55, verse 8. Rather familiar words. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now those familiar words follow what I believe I've said already in the few months that I've been here already to you about the verses that precede because when he says seek ye the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near and then he says let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts let the wicked forsake his way his way and the unrighteous his thoughts he's not talking to the wicked and the unrighteous out there. But he's letting us know that we may not take our ways and our thoughts, and when we take our ways and our thoughts and say they're better than his ways and his thoughts, then we are unrighteous and wicked. So he's coming to his church. He's coming to us. He knows what it is to be with us and to be a part of a difficult way sometimes as we walk through this life. And he says to us in a beautiful reminder, let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Just seek the Lord. Return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy and to our God for he will abundantly pardon for he says, my thoughts and my ways are so much higher than yours. God's ways, God's thinking rather, God's thinking is eternal. As eternal as God is. Always has been. So his thinking is as eternal as he is. He is unchangeable. As unchangeable as he is, so his thinking is unchangeable. There has never been a time when God has not thought. 
And he still actively thinks, even though in his thoughts he determined in his eternal counsel and plan everything that would take place in the course of this life. But the course of the world in the 6,000 plus years that will make up the time of this world is nothing in comparison to the eternity of God and to the eternal and everlasting life that he has planned. And every detail of that is as planned as every little detail of life on this earth, in this galaxy, in this solar system. He is actively thinking. He is constantly conscious of everything that he has determined concerning us. Everything is consciously before his mind's eye. I learned something, and I got to work to remember it, and then just take some thoughts about this sermon. Well, the thoughts on this sermon had to be set aside this morning because I can't think of both at the same time. I've got to take them aside and then work on that one, and then I've got to go back, and I've got to recall that's the way we work. God's thoughts have everything always equally and beautifully ever present right there before him. And that implies that he never forgets. Never. He never has to recall, never has to remember. It implies that he does everything thoughtfully. Some of the children God has given to me will do things that have caused me, as I was raising them, to say to them, look at me, don't you think? Of course they thought. But they acted or spoke impulsively. They, they didn't do it thoughtfully. They thought and they said what they thought. Or they did what they thought. And they didn't think twice. We say, didn't you think? Of course they thought. But they didn't evaluate. They didn't look at what they thought the first time and evaluate whether it was a right or good or beneficial thought or action or word. God does everything thoughtfully. His actions are always controlled by his thinking. Nothing is impulsive. Nothing is spontaneous. He's thought it all out. Further, we can say that God's thoughts are settled and definite. He doesn't question himself. God never has this. Two hours later, boy, I wish I had said that. Or I wish I had done that. Everything is done in a perfect wisdom. Out of the mind, the thoughts, the thinking of God. He says further about his thoughts that they're just not abstract thoughts. He wants, as he's dealing with the captives, to know that his thoughts are thoughts toward you. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Now if we gather all of scripture, then we know that in God's thinking and in God's works, there's a priority. 
and that at the top, in God's thinking, he's a jealous God because he's such a holy and perfect God. He is the only one who has the right to be jealous because he is so holy and so perfect. And he has the right to be jealous because his love is a perfect love. And he seeks his own glory first and primarily. And in that level of priority, while he himself is at the top, he lets us know that in, that in his thinking, that, that it's not distinct from, and it's not when he's, he's going to not think about himself, but then he's going to think about us, but that he thinks about us, and those are thoughts that are described in the text as toward us, or as we find in other places of scripture, they are unto us. And by that wording, he tells us that he seeks us. He's attentive to us. He's not against us, but he's toward us. Isaiah chapter 40, in the last verse, the psalmist says, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. I am poor and needy. I'm good for nothing. But my value is not determined by my poorness or my neediness or my knowledge about myself. But my value is this. The Lord thinketh upon me. When God raised Jesus and then brought him to a position of ascension to his right hand. And in that position at God's right hand, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22, God put all things under Jesus' feet and then gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. God looked at the position that he gave to Jesus, and he said, now this position of exaltation, where you will be, as it were, not at my right hand only, but my right hand of strength, as I execute my will and good pleasure, my thoughts throughout all of time, in every age, and in every part of creation, you are my right hand, he said to Jesus, but you are going to exercise them to the church. You can't forget the church. God said to these people, here they are in captivity. They're separated from their families. They can't worship because the, the temple, they're, they're long ways away from the temple. Not yet destroyed, but they can't worship there. They can't bring a sacrifice and in giving a sacrifice, find out that they're forgiven. And see the smoke rise. And then see the incense rise. And say, God's hearing my prayers. There they were. God doesn't care. We're forgotten. He doesn't know what's happening to us way over here. We're outside of his thoughts. And he says, no. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Sometimes little children, ah, they're just little kids. They're not that important in the body. God says, my arm rules in such a way that I am a shepherd of the sheep and I carry the little ones in my bosom. I know each and every little one. You're not forgotten. I think about you. I know you. I'm always thinking about you. Now you know what we do? 
We always think about us too. We're always thinking about our little circle. What's, what is happening to me? What other people think about me? We think we have to take care of ourselves and protect ourselves and defend ourselves and explain ourselves. God says, I know what I think toward you. <coughs> you are my beloved. I am not against you. I am toward you. I am upon you. I am for you. I love you. That's another way of saying you are you are always in my mind. I can't stop thinking about you. I wake up thinking about you. I go to sleep thinking about you. That's the way we would say it. God says, you're always right there. I think about you. I care about you. You know, the familiar words of Psalm 139. Well, wait a minute. I, I read the last verse of uh, Psalm 40 a bit ago. I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. In verse 5 of Psalm 40, he said, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us word. Many are thy thoughts which are to us word. But then think about Psalm 139. Psalm 139 has later in it that God knows us in the deepest and darkest recesses of our mother's womb when we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And in the earlier part he talks about how he by his spirit watches over us all the time. He begins, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. He thinks about us. He knows us. And then the psalmist says in verse 6, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. But then later on, this is what he says. And I think, I, I really, if you're like me, I'm going to judge you by myself. When you sing 383, yeah, that first stanza, all that I am I owe to thee. Thy wisdom, Lord, hath fashioned me. But then we get into it later on. But then that second stanza sometimes, I don't know if we appreciate it, but here it's a versification of these verses. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. Now, which thoughts? It's not just saying, to me, your thoughts are precious. Yes, he's implying that. But the first thought and meaning of this text is, your thoughts about me, your thoughts toward me are precious, O oh God. How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more than number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. I'm still in your thoughts. You didn't forget me. I, I slept. I forgot. You never forgot me. God's thoughts are toward us. The captives thought God doesn't care. They judged the God by their circumstances. And then he says to them through the prophet, I caused you to be brought there. That was not an accident. It wasn't just because Nebuchadnezzar had a stronger army at that time. I, I caused that. There's trouble in your life. I know. It is what I ordered. But I'm not against you. And I've not forgotten you. I know. 
I'm doing it thoughtfully. I'm doing it in the wisdom of a long, thought-out plan that is exactly perfect as I judge it. I want you, as you walk through this valley, to carry crosses. I've determined the cross. I've measured the cross. I've timed the cross. And I have determined that in every suffering, I would give an equal amount of strength, yes, but also comfort. As the sufferings abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. I know the weight, and it's never too much, for my grace to give you the ability to bear it. Now, last thought in the first point. When God says, I know the thoughts that I think, he wants us to say, Amen. The primary key, important ingredient, is not that I know, we know the thoughts, but that he knows the thoughts. His actions and his thoughts are too high. His ways are sometimes too deep. And again, that incident of the children of Israel going through the Red Sea, they did, the, the light was way behind them. Ahead of them, it was pitch black. It was in the middle of the night. And it wasn't nice, bright, starry night and with a moon lit. No, it was pitch black dark. And they got to go down into a waterbed, and the rain is torrents. It's pouring forth. And you want us to walk down there in the midst of that mud? It cannot be raining. And a lightning can flash. And I shiver. And then when the thunder claps, the hair on the back of my head goes up. And I shake. And you want us to go down there? And then... If that's not enough, the earth starts quaking. Can you imagine what those walls, what that did to the walls of the Red Sea when in an earthquake? God's command in Exodus to Moses and Aaron was, you lead. You lead. You want an example of what it means to be a husband? You lead First duty our form gives to every husband to lead with discretion. You don't chase, you don't drive, you don't go behind. God didn't want Moses and Aaron to do that. You tell them to go. No, God said to Moses and Aaron, you go. Go forward. And there they went. In Psalm 77, in 211, it says it beautifully. Safe thy people thou didst keep mighty shepherd of the sheep. But he led them by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And there they went. 
And they had a lead exercising a faith that said, God knows that he knows what he wants us to do when he says go forward. So we go forward in the dark. But God knows what he's thinking. We don't have to know. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Some of us don't like that. Some of us have natures that say, I gotta know. And I'm not gonna have a sense of peace until I know. And God says, no. You just know that I know the thoughts. And then hear, hear your Father, your Heavenly Father, say to us, my little children, don't trouble yourself with things that are too great for you. Leave them to me. Leave them to my understanding. Just seek me and obey me. And you do that so simply, it's not complicated, you just love me. My command is you love me with your all. Now you have every reason to love me because I love you first. But if you want to obey me, then just love me with everything you've got. But he tells us more. He tells us more. He tells us that it's not just that he knows his thoughts towards us. He says, I want you to know that my thoughts towards you, first of all, are thoughts of peace and not of evil. <clears throat> evil means bad. Bad in the sense of this is punishment for something that we did wrong for past sins. God's getting me now. The devil plants the seed of that thought constantly before God's people because he wants to defame the name, the good name and honor of our Father in heaven. So he says that. And that's what the believers in captivity in Babylon were thinking. But God says, and this is the contrast, not evil, not bad, but I have thoughts of peace. That's an interesting contrast to evil. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Yes, but why are God's thoughts of peace toward us? Therefore, being justified by faith without works, we have peace with God. God has declared us, for the sake of the work of his Son, to be not at war with us, but in harmony with us. See, sometimes we identify peace as a, just lack of war. Yes, that's it. It is not war, but peace is more than that. Peace is God saying, I am at harmony with you. I have a positive, good relationship with you. And again, it's, it's that, and I'm never going to get weary of telling you this, it arises out of, theologically we say the covenant. Good, great word. But it's a sense of communion and fellowship. It's love as a result of the work of God and his plan to establish a relationship with us where he says, you're my friend and I am your friend. You're my people. I'm your God. I love you. I don't do this because I'm mad at you. I don't do this because I hate you. I haven't lost my temper. No. That's earthly fathers. Remember we said they're pictures. That's sometimes they slam the door. They pound the fist. 
not the real father. He never loses it. Never. He didn't lose it now when he said, you rotten, disobedient Judas, Jews, I'm going to teach you a lesson now. You go sit in your room. You may work on the computer. You may do this. We've got all kinds of lists. God is not doing it in that kind of an attitude. It is an attitude of peace, harmony. He sees us in such a way that he delights in us. Now the captives and we sometimes scratch our heads and say, I'm not so sure about that. That's not what I feel and that's not what I experience. (coughs) Then he says, you hold my word to be truth. That's the source of truth. Not what you're thinking, not what you feel. You think this? My thoughts are higher than yours. Don't judge me by your little thoughts. My thoughts are thoughts of peace. If I am for you, then nothing can be against you. Nothing. The way may be hard, but it's never out of the motive to do us harm or damage. And then he says, I have a plan. And there is an end to that plan. And there's an expectation, a future. In In God's perfect providence, we were able to talk about that expectation this morning. An object of faith. We hold for truth that teaching of God and his word that he has a home. Not very familiar to us yet, but it's a home. Call it a home. It's a beautiful home. It's a comfortable home. We focus on the present. We want the th- certain things of the present to continue. And we have all kinds of fears about an unknown future. Fears that often paralyze us and rob us of the strength to be able to deal with the present. But God declares to us that he has an expectation in mind, an end. And Jesus tells us of that when he says to his father in a prayer, I want those whom thou hast given to me to be with me. I want them to behold my glory. I want them to know that thou hast loved me from before the foundations of the world. I want them to see my glory that I am loved. And I want them to know that that's their glory, that they're loved. And so the Babylonian captivity is a part of God's preparation of his people for an expected end. God's thinking is good. And he says he is able. He is able. Sometimes you've got to stop right there. Don't go, yeah, I know the verse goes on, but sometimes you just have to stop. He is able. He is able to take affliction that is extremely hard and say, it's light. And it's momentary. It seems to go on and on. Is there ever going to be? It's momentary. While we look, not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. He lets us know that the rod is in the hand of a father. 
And though it's presently grievous, it yields peaceable, isn't that an interesting word? It yields peaceable fruit. Hebrews 12, verse 11. To them that are exercised thereby. So he strips us so we may be clothed. He empties us so we can be really filled. He makes us sorry so we can know what it is to be forgiven. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Let us bow. And let us realize that we are among the unrighteous and the wicked who want always to place our thoughts and our ways higher than his. And he says, no, you bow. My ways are higher than yours. wants us to trust, to trust, this is the way it's put in a salty number, to trust his love. Not just trust some blind God, no, trust his love. Kiss the rod and the hand that holds the rod. In his love abiding, I have joy and peace. And then we have an expectation too, a good expectation. He will work all things together for good. He puts it this way in verse 10. After 70 years, I will visit you and perform my good word. Toward you. I will perform my good word. This is his good word. He knows what he's thinking toward you. Trust him and love him. Amen. We thank thee, Lord, for thy speech, thy word. <clears throat> Speak it to us in such a way that we will appreciate and understand enough to know that we don't have to judge thee, that we ought not, but that we can trust thy love and thy plan that arises out of thy love for us in Christ. For Jesus' sake we pray this prayer. Amen. Beautiful words of Psalm 23 as they're found in Psalter number 55. 55. Thy goodness, Lord, shall guide me. Thy mercy cheer my way. A home thou wilt provide me within thy house for a. Let's sing all three stanzas of 55.
Jehovah bless you and keep you. Jehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And Jehovah lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.